Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Dillard. I'm a senior solution architect with Influx Data. A uh, little background on me. I've been with Influx for almost four years now. Um, I was here pre 1.0. So before GA and before we had an actual commercial product, actually. So I've been here for a long time. And, I, and in that time, I've done a lot of work with our customers and our community users on optimizing their performance of influx db from both a write standpoint uh, and a query standpoint as well as compression standpoint so um i you know i'm a good person to ask about this stuff and, and i was tasked with this this presentation today because of that and so hopefully i can impart some of that knowledge onto you today the agenda is pretty basic um it's it'll start with the write method um i'll spend a lot of time on that um, InfluxDB is, as you know, a schema on write database. So the write method, the way you write to it really does matter. It's also kind of how you plan your schema. So those two things should be thought of kind of in, in tandem with one another. So we'll move on to schema as well. Talk about how, what to think about when you're planning your schema, which affects how you write to the database, what that means for querying and things like that. And then we'll talk about queries. So um, it'll be a briefer topic, but that, you know, there is some low hanging fruit some concepts that you can employ about how influx ql in the 1.x line of, in, of influx db works and so you can take that with you and, and uh, try to improve your query performance overall so to start out this is uh you know you're not a software company if you don't have you know cartoon animal logos for your products this is the telegraph tiger and if there's one thing i you know you can take away from today is that um, Telegraph is a tool you really should be using. It's completely open source um, and is designed to work with InfluxDB. So if you're not familiar with Telegraph, this is a, a brief primer on it. So it is a lightweight agent it's designed to sit on hosts or any other kind of IoT asset you may have in your fleet and pull data in various ways from various different services or um, sources. And on the right is a, is a snippet of TOML which is what the configuration language is for Telegraph. And you'll notice there that it's very simple, right? We've configured pulling CPU metrics, mem metrics, swap, disk IO, disk, and so on from your host that Telegraph is sitting on. There, there are ways you can configure each specific plugin, but these are generally not necessary with those. But as an example, we have an HTTP plugin, which is configured specifically to scrape formatted metrics from various endpoints. Here is just local host endpoints, but it could be remote endpoints. You can also prescribe it what format you should be collecting. So it should expect JSON in this case. And there is, that is actually calling a JSON parser, which is core to Telegraph. And you can configure that as well to tell it what, how to parse the JSON messages. Another reason to use Telegraph is it's built by us, right? So it's built to interface with InfluxDB specifically. So it's a framework for all of the best practices that we're gonna talk about today. Um, some of those though, just from a method of writing, it does formatting of the data in, a, in an appropriate way. It does you know, client best practices like retries and timeouts um, and you know, it, you know, logs appropriately for, for what's happening with its, its interfacing with Influx. Modifying batch sizes and flush jitters and things like that so that you can spread writes out over time. It does tag sorting lexicographically, which is something Influx would do if you didn't do it on the client side. So this is again, um, helping you alleviate some of the pressure that Influx deals with if you need to do that. If needed, Telegraph can also be used as a pre-processing engine. So you can do that at the edge as an agent or you can do it interstitially in your data path, but you can do things like enriching your data or converting um, types, you know, like tags to fields or fields to tags. We'll talk about what those terms mean if you're relatively new to this. Um, regex and grok transformations, renaming of things, and then aggregations. Like you can do basic, you know, basic aggregations that you may want to do at query time, but instead you want to, you know, you know what you want to do. You can improve queries by pre-aggregating this data if you know how to do that. Um, and then even some statistical functions like variance and standard deviation. Really quick, some popular plugins just to kind of give you an idea of what, what services Telegraph can be used to pull from. 
Telegraph's a great way to monitor Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, it's, it monitors the Kubelet API as well as the API server itself out of the box. Um, it is great with interfacing with Kafka, so it can produce to and consume from Kafka topics. Um, it monitors the network, SNMP protocol, SFlow protocol. Uh, we have NetFlow coming out pretty soon and various other things like, you know, on the kernel level, Net and NetStat and things like that. Redis, Nginx, HAProxy, those are, you know, sort of best of breed open source tooling that Telegraph has out of the box plugins for. Jalokia is a way to grab JMX metrics. If you're a, if you're a JVM shop, right, you can grab custom metrics from your, your uh, Java applications. Um, and then outside of out of the box, Telegraph also pulls or, or listens for metrics that are custom. So over HTTP or socket, it can expose a port to listen for metrics in certain formats like JSON or CSV. It can also scrape those endpoints like you saw in the previous slide. Prometheus metrics. So if you have um, applications within Kubernetes, for instance, that are exporting Prometheus exposition format into a metrics endpoint, you can annotate those and have Telegraph auto discover those endpoints and pull Prometheus metrics and write those into, into Influx in an optimized way. It also has an exec or exec D plugin. There's two different ways of calling out to external scripts or applications that can that can pull metrics and then it runs it through telegraph to go to basically capture all of those best practices again and stats d which is a common way of doing um sort of higher level apm inside of telegraph this is sort of a mental model of what's going on inside of telegraph um, think of telegraph it's not exactly this but you can think of it as sort of like a, a dag if you will um, where the you know you have your sources or your inputs these are input plugins within which you can you can um, configure parsers from there as you, as data gets ingested into telegraph it will pass through a any processor plugins you may have configured to do transformation enrichment and decoration and even filtering um, and kind of routing if you will um, and then from there is aggregation so when you have your data the way you want it and where you want it you can aggregate on it Right. So you can you can find averages and mins and maxes and you can do statistical analysis on it, um, basically. Right. Not these are not often used aggregations, but they can be used. And, and in certain cases, I do work with my customers to do those things up front. And then Influx also outputs to many, many outputs. Um, obviously, it is designed to interface best with Influx DB, but you can write it to a local file if you want. It produces to Kafka, as we've seen that pattern. Um, it can write out to CloudWatch or Datadog, whatever, whatever other service you may have. Um, Wavefront, for instance, is another cloud monitoring service that actually uses Telegraph as a first-class citizen. So it writes to that very well as well. Um, a little primer on the parsing. This is an example or just a, a short list of some of the uh, formats that we can parse in Telegraph. The most common being JSON, CSV, and Graphite. Other than Line Protocol, which we'll talk about, but that's the influx format. The screenshot at the bottom here is an example of parsing CSV. So what I've configured here is a HTTP listener exposing uh, the port 8080, and it's expecting CSV format. If you know what your CSV looks like beforehand, which you, will, you do need to know, um, it will, you can prescribe to it how it parses it. So what the column names should be and what each column should be as far as tag, field, measurement, or timestamp. So you can format your line protocol very prescriptively this way. <clears throat> so uh, brief primer on architectural patterns. This is one we see a lot and it's also a best practice, I would say. So conceptually you have your telegraphs running as agents in your fleet, right? So they're whatever assets you may have, whether it's applications, whether it's bare metal hosts, whether it's sensors or, um, large pieces of equipment. It could be Kubernetes clusters, Mesos clusters, pods, you, you name it, right? That's your edge. It writes data out um, and produces to a queue, for instance. And so that could be Kafka, it could be Rabbit, and, or any, any other ones that are listed there. I think there are others as well. And then Telegraph, again, can consume from Kafka or Rabbit or Active um, and in an intelligent way. So it will only consume when it can write. Out. So, so the, the point of this architectural pattern is to persist data within your data path 
So the queues are actually writing data to disk. So, tele so if Telegraph were for any reason to not be able to write, instead of filling up its buffer and dying and, and dropping metrics, it will stop, stop consuming so that you can retain the data in the data pipeline. And then it outputs to say InfluxDB. Here's another, this is a more simple example, but uh, if you don't need to harden that pipeline, you can just aggregate data at a sort of, this is what I call the interstitial layer. Um, you know, you can have 10,000 telegraphs write to five or 10 to batch up the writes and write, you know, in larger, with larger bodies to InfluxDB, which is actually an optimal way to write to Influx so that it doesn't have to deal with um, a bunch of connections simultaneously or a bunch of HTTP, you know, header parsing and stuff like that. Uh, this should be pretty basic, but it's worth noting. Balanced ingestion helps. So this is kind of talking about flush jitters and stuff like that. Um, again, basic concept, but at the top here is an example of, and these are two different workloads, by the way. Um, they, they're just sort of customers of ours that I've noticed, you know, had both good and bad workloads or, you know, bad is from an optimization standpoint. Up top here, is balanced ingestion, right? These are requests per minute, writes and reads. And it's happening in a relatively, you know, spread out over time, right? There's, there's lack of peak. There is a peak there, but that may be because they actually had a peak, right? It's not a constant workload. But down below, you'll notice that the node is actually not working a lot of, a lot of the time, right? So it's doing nothing and then it's doing a lot and then it's doing nothing and then it's doing a lot. But what you'd rather do is kind of flatten the curve, if you will, which is a highly topical term nowadays. Um, another example of that, not requests per minute, but just the actual resource utilization. Again, these are different workloads. So you, that's why you'll notice the different actual, the different uh, level of CPU utilization here. But at the top is balanced ingestion. At the bottom is less, right? It's, it's not as balanced. The bottom could probably operate at a more constant rate of maybe three or four percent, but but it does happen to hit you know eight or nine percent. Um, if that were a higher, if that were a, a larger workload on you know on a smaller machine, then those peaks could actually cause problems, right? So that you need, if you're going to have peak workloads, you need to have overhead for that, or you need to balance the ingestion. By the way, the same the same applies to queries. Queries are a little harder to control um, in that way, but if you can, that's that's a good way to do it. Okay, so again, really this is kind of the same topic. They're, they really go hand in hand, but I will just sort of emphasize schema more than the right method itself now. When designing schema, there are generally three high level goals. The first one is to reduce your measurement and tag cardinality, which is um, you know, really a pervasive uh, problem in the time series ecosystem, right? Cardinality is a word you hear a lot. You want to reduce that as much as you can. Some workloads don't allow you to, and that's fine. Then you just deal with it. You throw more resources at the problem. But if you can, reduce it. Um, another thing that kind of helps with that, but also in general helps with performance is reducing the data or the information that you encode into keys like measurements or tags. Um, and I will talk about that in, in depth and uh, what that means in some coming slides. Key lengths as well. Um, if you can, the size of, of your data matters, right? It matters when you write to the cache and in influx. It matters on disk. It matters in your payload. Um, it matters on the block inside of on your disk, right? So if you can write more metrics onto a block, then you can get higher performance, right? So the, the IO there, it does matter, the throughput of your, of your disk. Those three things really um, improve write performance completely, query performance completely, and then an often overlooked thing is data readability and explorability. So you know, to, to explore your data, you're running meta queries, right? Those meta queries need to perform well and produce readable results. And when you run those meta queries against data that's not readable, it's very hard to understand what you're actually storing and then how to how to work with your data. So um, with people with practice, this is a very valuable thing. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a customer present at Influx Days and, and they said something that, that, uh, that stuck with me. This was a, a, a presentation about line protocol, actually, our data format. And this guy, Richard Lasky, at our customer said, it's a feature, not a bug, but features require thinking. And that was really great because 
people are used to things like graphite and Prometheus metrics, um, you know, collect D and stats D style stuff where it's really underlying it's, it's key value pairs. Um, in line protocol, it's really not a key value pair. It's a, it's an entire record. If you write it, if you write it appropriately and that's by design that actually has a lot of benefits, but it's important to understand how that works and then how to, how to make it, make it that way essentially. And so we'll talk about that as well. <clears throat> so this is a brief primer on line protocol. Um, if you're listening to this presentation, there's a, at least a 50% chance you already know what this is and how to format it, but I'm going to talk about it briefly regardless. So at the top there, other than the title is um, what line protocol is defined as. So you've got a measurement, which is everything before the first comma, everything after the first comma and before the first space. So punctuation matters here is your tag set. A tag set is a set of key value pairs of metadata. After the first space and before the second space is your field set, which is again, a set of key value pairs. These are your actual metrics. These are the things that you are measuring over time. Um, what cardinality is, is the, is, you know, is the total number of time series that you are storing. And the series is defined by a series key. And a series key is a measurement tag set and a single field key. So I'll show you what that looks like, but keep that in mind. Um, a single point in time is obviously with a timestamp, but basically a series is the measurement tag set and a field key with, uh, and then the series itself is just the values being appended over time. So, you know, we talk about what line protocol is, how to format it, but a common question is, okay, but what do I make? What, what do I make a measurement? What do I make a tag and so on? So this is what I tell people, right? So think of a measurement, as a SQL table. It is absolutely not a SQL table, so don't treat it that way, but think of it that way as far as organizing your metrics. It's a, it's a namespace for logically alike metrics. It's for categorization more than anything else. Um, to give you an example, CPU is a measurement um, that telegraph outputs, right? And there's lots of ways to measure CPU, usage user, usage guest, usage nice, usage idle, whatever. All of those are actual metrics. They have values that you care about over time, but they're ways of describing CPU. So CPU is the measurement, those are fields, and then the thing that distinguishes between the things from which you are measuring your CPU usage metrics are tags. That's your metadata, that's, your, that's the data that describes the assets that you're monitoring. Uh, another example would be transactions, right? Anything that you can use to monitor transactions, right? So like if PayPal were to monitor the activity between Venmo and, and users and things like that, um, you know, you might pull the dollar amount, the response time of the request, whether it timed out or not, things like that. And that would be under a measurement called transactions. What to make a tag. So the things that you want to, you want to think about when you're thinking of what should be a tag is again, um, something that distinguishes your assets. And the reason why that's important is because that's what you're gonna group by, right? If I have a host where I'm monitoring CPU, I don't wanna monitor CPU for all hosts necessarily. I wanna, I care about which host is doing what, which ones are performing poorly, which ones are performing well. So I need to provide metadata that distinguishes the host. So host name, host ID, IP, whatever, uh, it could be region, availability zone. That's all stuff that you're gonna to wanna to group by in queries. The caveat to that is that all of that is indexed. Tags are indexed, it's all stored in memory and all adds to cardinality. So where you can try to, to reduce the number of tags or the tag cardinality that you're storing. Um, but a lot of use cases require that you do store high cardinality tags. Um, what to make a field? So T fields are <laughs> in a sense, the opposite of tags. Um, the field key is part of the series, but the values are actually stored on disk. They are not indexed. You can perform math on them. So this is the stuff that you're doing computing on, right? You're doing means, mins, maxes, percentiles, and rates and things like that on this stuff over time. You cannot group by these. Um, you, there's an exception to that. If you use flux, which is the, the newer query engine and language, uh, you can, um, with a pivot, you can group by fields, but, um, in general for the, for the purpose of this conversation, 
uh, or this presentation, you can't group by fields. So there's really kind of a Goldilocks principle you apply to these things, right? Like th anything could be a tag or a field. You know, you might want to work with your solution architect like myself, if you have one, um, to figure out which one uh, makes sense for your specific use case. So here's an example of what I would consider, um, you know, moving bad metric to good metric. Above here is basically, as far as I know, basically graphite format, um, or, you know, the, it, it's a common format. It's basically a key value pair, right? Uh, it's a dot notated key value pair. Um, if you were listening about how you define line protocol, you might notice here at the top that there are no commas in those metrics, which means that influx DB will, will translate everything from CPU all the way through usage user in that top line into the measurement name, which is really bad, right? So if you think about, uh, if you're running a SQL, if you're running SQL, every single, um, every single different host and every single metric becomes its own table, right? Yeah, the values are gonna be in that table, but every single host you have and every single metric that you want to track of that host will be its own table. That is not good no matter whether you're using relational or time series databases. So that's a very important distinction with how measurements work, right? Um, so to prevent that, we come down to the bottom here and We've parsed out the, the information into the, where, where, what kind of uh, influx types they should be. So CPU is measurement, right? It's before the first comma. We've, we've parsed out the dot notated metadata into primitives, right? So into host and region tags. So we can group by both host and region now, or, or you know either or both. And we've named the key the field key usage user instead of having it value. So one of the problems here is value doesn't have any information, right? The information about value is held in the, what is the measurement name? But when you name the key and put information into the field key itself, you can actually put many fields into the same line or the same record, which has benefits that I'll talk about later. But that's really the design goal of line protocol is to be able to do that and make sure that Really, you don't name anything value or gauge or counter, which are things that you might see a lot. So that's, that's uh, encoding data into measurements. The same thing can happen with tags, or you can overload tags. So in this case, we've, we've appropriately defined the measurement in the bad section, but we have one tag that should be two and a field, right? So in this case, having one tag to describe both the host name and the region it's in, as well as the field actually, because that's part of that, that string, um, means that we have to do regex um, when we're querying, right? It makes the data less readable and it also makes the queries less performant. And then again, we've used the field key value, which holds no information on its own. So at the bottom here, we've separated out that tag into, into its primitives. We now have a host tag and we have a region tag both those can be grouped by. Um, the cardinality hasn't changed, just makes the query engine perform better. And then we've also named the field key, right? So um, if the line below it, let's say, were US, region equals US West as well, then we would have the same measurement tag set. Usage system could then be pivoted and put into the same line above, right? Because the timestamp is also the same. So you can measure both usage user and usage system in the same record. Cool, so now that you understand that, um, that concept, again, it comes down to how do I employ these, these concepts? So here's just an example. There are many ways to do this, but a convenient way is to use Telegraph. So if you're writing graphite metrics, run them through Telegraph um, in whatever input you wanna, you wanna instantiate your parser in. So in this case, it's a HTTP listener, again, you're, so basically you're making post requests where the body is, um, is, is graphite format. And then you're setting a template, which is a mapping of how to, how to, what to map your input into an output. So you'll notice that the first segment of the dot notation and the second becomes the measurement name. You'll see the, the output becomes CPU underscore usage because I've, I've prescribed the underscore as a delimiter. The, 
host001, I've named host as a tag name. So you'll see in the output, it's host equals host001. Uh, the region becomes region equals EU East. And then everything else is field. So now I have this metric that, that complies with InfluxDB best practices. I can group by host, I can group by region, and I have information in the field key. So this is, that's a very good line of line protocol. Telegraph has other helper plugins. So um, if, you have, if you have lines of line protocol that don't conform to these best practices, you can use something called a pivot processor, which will automatically have all of the inputs uh, run through it and it will apply the rule you see in the example uh, to those metrics. So for, if you determine that like in this case, name should be a field instead, uh, and not a tag, then you can pivot it so that it becomes the field key. So you're, you can see an example of that below. Um, what you'll notice there is that the measurement and tag set are the same for both time idle and time user. So you could, in this case, it's not happening, but you could merge those into the same line. And that's where the merge aggregator plugin comes in. So again, remember DAG, it goes, you know, you do have the processor, it does that process, then it feeds it to the aggregator, and in this case, the merge aggregator. This is a screenshot of a PR. This is actually a live feature now. It's kind of an outdated slide. But it does, again, what, what's, what you see in the example here. You've got common measurement tag set fields. So usage time and idle time have the same measurement and tag set, which is CPU and host equals local host. And what this plugin does is it merges those two fields into the same record. And I'll show you, I'll exemplify a, the benefit of that in a second. But just some extra visual aid in, in the benefits of this. So here's just some stock prices, right? We've got three symbols, BP, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, and we're monitoring just price, right? Just price. I don't know what type of price it is, but it's just price. So we've got, in this graph, we've got a grouped by situation where we group by symbol and we're, we're selecting price from stock prices. So this is where we get three lines, right? Each, each, vertical, each vertical instance is a point in time, right? Where those values were changing. This is a candlestick graph. If, you're, if you are not familiar with that, it's okay. But this is a zoom in of, of specifically ExxonMobil where we're tracking not just price, but actually four different ways of measuring price. So at each point in time, we are looking at open price, high price, low price, and close price of ExxonMobil in the measurement stock prices. And so those are plotted. So each of these candlesticks, each point in time is actually four metrics. And that was written in one record, right? So that's what line protocol supports. Um, and if you were to go back, right, so this is actually three symbols, stock symbols. If you were to have a group by symbol here, um, you would instead just have um, three sets of candlesticks and a total of 12 metrics um, at every point in time. <clears throat> the merging of, of uh, different field keys into the same series, essentially the same uh, measurement and tag set is exemplified here. So originally we had what's under from, which is writing every single piece of metadata every time you want to write a new metric. Um, but below is the merging happening, right? So this is way less, um, way less, way smaller in size from a payload standpoint and also has downstream benefits um, when writing to InfluxDB for multiple reasons. Okay, so um, we're coming close to the end here, but we're going to talk about queries briefly. Um, queries, as you, I'm sure you know, are really case by case, and they're they're snowflakey. So it's hard to just kind of prescribe to you how to best write queries. But there are some pieces of low hanging fruit that I can impart onto you now. So. Um, this is all function based, right? A query is a query, but each function actually has kind of its own attributes. Um, so there's actually a distinction between streaming functions and batch functions. So a batch function is a function that requires all of the data that it's going to compute to be in memory at the same point in time. So percentile spread and, and so on 
are all functions that read all data into memory and then perform their computation and then spit out the result. That's fine if you have the memory, the memory headroom, but sometimes you don't, right? So it's important to at least be aware of that, that attribute of these functions so that um, you know you need to have more headroom for memory, or at least you can point to a problem if you're, if you're having unusual memory spikes like heap or, or just you know, generally high memory usage on your node that you don't expect it otherwise. Stream functions are things like mean, bottom, first, which is really the most common functions, which is good. But what this means is it pulls in only small subsets of the data and performs computations on it um, in a streaming fashion and kind of holds state. So you don't have to pull in the whole set into, into working memory to perform their computations. Um, and then if you are an enterprise customer or a cloud one customer, uh, you have a cluster, right? Um, that is the enterprise bits that, perf that allow for clustering and, and uh, replication of data across nodes. So if you have a distributed function in a query, that query can be served, or that function it specifically can be served across nodes. So while it might be one core per function per node, you can do that across two or three nodes depending on your replication factor in the cluster. So those distributed functions um, are counted there. There, there are other ones, there are other examples of, of all of these, but those are the kind of the most common ones. And then local functions are basically uh, a one-to-one -one mapping of, to batch functions, right? They just, they need to, you need to have the entire working set local to the function being, um, to being run for it to actually, for it to actually make its computation. So um, again, local, the local and batch functions are, if you don't need them, get rid of them, right? If you do need them, fine, just know what they do, right? So that you can, you can plan accordingly. By the way, uh, again, a, a kind of a selling point for Flux, the new query language and engine is that for functions like percentile and for, for derivative and stuff like that, they actually use algorithms like T-Digest to do streaming estimations of those, of those um, computations so they don't have to pull in the entire working set. You can opt into that to have it be more accurate even, but in general, the default is to not do that. So these are much less memory intensive functions in the future. This one should be pretty obvious, but um, if you're not used to working with time series data, maybe it's not. Um, time series data by nature is not CRUD, right? It's not, you're not just doing updates and replacing values. You are appending new values over time because you care about the change. You care about the new and the old. So by nature, the volume is higher, right? There's just more data. So doing a select, uh, a query where you're not bounding by time is, is pretty bad. I mean, you can honestly pull, bring down an entire cluster pretty quickly if you do that, right? Depending on your workload size. The other thing to note though, is that it's fundamentally a columnar store, like any time series database is, or a lot of NoSQL databases are fundamentally. Um, so select star, basically pulling an entire record, many, many full records is generally not a good idea. It works, but it doesn't perform well. So specifying series by selecting certain metrics or doing where clauses on certain tags or fields, you can narrow the scope of the query and specify exactly which series you want to pull data out of. And when doing that, that is when influx and any columnar store is really, 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 really performant, right? You can pull data out very efficiently and do computations on that data extremely fast. Um, also, um, in the middle here, selecting an aggregate of a field um, against the same data set as you would otherwise select the raw metric itself, the aggregate version is more performant. I believe that's really most, mostly to do with the computation happening at the storage level. It's kind of a push down effect. It also um, requires less bandwidth over the wire and less for, the, for your UI or whatever to render it, right? It's just less data overall. Caveat there is if you pre-aggregate metrics, so if you do a mean and you, and you actually select raw data from a pre-aggregated data set, that's the most performant way you can do it, right? You're, you're not doing any computation, you're selecting raw data from data that's already aggregated. So that's a, a use case for downsampling, as we say. Um, and then lastly, reduce your group by time intervals. So grouping by time, grouping by host or grouping by tag, for instance, is, is great. Grouping by time, also, also great, but um, 
is more expensive, right? Because it actually performs a computation. So um, I've actually seen people doing group by time 500 milliseconds before, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially when, you're, when your metric precision is one second or 10 seconds, right? It doesn't really make any sense, but it does. it is very expensive on the database. So if you don't need very granular time windows to perform um, aggregations on, reduce them, right? So if you have a group by time five seconds and your query is taking a long time and you don't need it, your time windows to be that granular, move it to one minute or five minutes or whatever, right? It's, you know, if, if you have a query that's one day, seven days, 30 days of data, those kinds of changes can drastically improve performance of your query. So just some food for thought, take that with you. And, and uh, maybe if you're having performance issues, you can look at your, some of your chronograph grafana dashboards or your your own ui and and make some changes there and with that i leave you um that's my contact information i'm really not a twitter person so i probably won't see you there but it's there in, in case <clears throat> i am very good at um, answering emails though i have both customers and and community members emailing me there and i always respond so feel free to to tag me there if you have questions about this stuff and I bid you adieu.